Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in uh, to our series that we've, has been happening for the last uh, couple of weeks, the stories women carry. Uh, my name is Karishma Bagani. I am your official question asker of this series, and it really is my privilege to be speaking to various women across the African continent and the diaspora starting next week, or starting today, actually, um, uh, about their creative experiences and their practices and their journeys, uh, just as a way of um, engaging folks in, in terms of their sort of thought leadership and, and how they um, continue their practice across the continent. I realize I haven't ever really talked about the inspiration behind this series, so I thought I would just plug in and say um, a, a short a short word about it. Um, it came out of a need to archive a lot of our practices in different ways on the continent. You know, as a practicing producer, director, um, and scholar now, uh, emerging scholar, um, I realized that there's just not enough. Uh, content for us to be picking from to understand how people are, are working in, in the African context um, uh, in, in, in the contemporary world. So I thought, why don't we start the series and thanks to the Hauran Theatre Commons and the Teberi Arts Foundation and the Musical Theatre Initiative, we've had the opportunity to um, renew this for a second series and hopefully keep continuing um, as, as we move forward. So uh, that's my little spiel for today. And um, I also thought I would share that we have been experiencing torrential rains here in Nairobi for the last few uh, days. And so my in internet connection and data is a bit all over the place. So it might mean that I, I pop off the call in between. Um, and uh, But that doesn't mean the conversation will not continue. But I thought I would let you know that that's part of the challenges uh, and, and some of the, the complexities we're navigating um, with data being so expensive and sometimes even having to pay that tax on it in certain countries um, on the continent. So uh, thank you for your patience and for bearing with us. And we're really, really excited that we are still able to bring this content and these creatives to you um, in whatever way, shape and form that we can. I'd also like to thank our wonderful ASL interpreter, Zina, who has been with us um, since the beginning of the series. So thank you so much for uh, being a part of our, our team and um, sharing it, what, this important conversation in a different language to uh, some of our other folks who, who have tuned in. So thank you. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to take this moment to introduce our panelist for today. Hi, Nikkei. Hi, Krishna. Lovely to be here. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, it's it's really, really a, a privilege to be speaking with you. Likewise, Krishma, thanks for inviting me and um, yeah, looking forward to seeing where we where this story goes. <laughs> oh, I have so much to ask you already because you, you have just such an interesting, interesting personal story, but also with the work that you're doing on the continent with and whilst also not being on the continent, I just have so many questions that I already have. So um, we should dive in. But uh, before I do that, I'll just share with our audiences. I met Nikkei again, COVID pandemic just has a way of bringing people together. So we haven't really met in person ever before, but it feels like I've known you, I don't know, since my past life. <laughs> Uh, with the number of phone calls we've been on together and panels and projects we've been collaborating on. So um, I met Nikkei through a partnership that we had with the Tebere Arts Foundation and NBO MTI, Musical Theatre Initiative, and the Pan-African Creative Exchange in South Africa, which you will speak about more today, um, where we were on the same panel and then we continued conversations about collaborating in other, in other ways to make creative platforms on the continent more accessible to our audiences and to our performers. So um, yeah, really excited to be learning more about that kind of work uh, from you today and sharing with our audiences. So why don't we start off, well, on a more personal note, why don't we start off um, just learning about you? How are you doing? Where in the world are you? And uh, what's cracking? <laughs> I'm in England and I'm happy to say um, it's not raining. It has been, most of last week was rain, so we're always a little bit happier in in England when the sun's out. So the sun's out, it's not warm, but at least it's sunny. So I'm here in England in my little office, just um, waiting for us to move things around and get the permission from the government to start moving around a lot more. So, yeah. I, That's great, I, uh, reversed roles here. It's always sunny in Nairobi, but uh, we're, we're, we've, we've taken the rain from you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely, lovely. So um, why don't we jump in and let, actually, even I don't know this, so I would love to learn more. Uh, 
tell us about how you sort of got into the arts. Tell us about what you do. Well, I know what you do, but tell us what you do now and what that journey looked like for you from. It's always hard, I guess. When I talk about what I do, it does change from day, day to day. So those of you who might have seen me talk before, it was, it's always a slightly different story. I do a number of things, I would say. I describe myself as a, a, a creative uh, mediator, um, somebody who also works across policy development and policy implementation it, it, with a, more of a focus on equality and diversity. And that's really, for me, it's about how you ensure that all people have access to the arts, to participate in the arts, to be part of the arts in whatever way, shape or form. So this is kind of like a bit of my, what I describe as my heart work. I am a visiting research fellow at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, and actually with an eye on um, equality and diversity. So talk, just, it, it's, it's, it really gives me the freedom to kind of uh, um, play it out the way that works for me. So, I've sat on interview panels, I've taught, I've worked um, closely with students, I've mentored a number of students, I've done a number of um, events and activities to kind of bring the thinking and the ideas together, because sometimes schools and institutions can be quite siloed, so how do you actually know each other from within? I also um, work for an organisation called Counterpoints Arch, um, in short, they seek to try to shift the way we think and talk about migration. Yes, people who are keeping an eye on in England right now would know that the energy around migration and displacement is actually quite negative and it's quite toxic. So our organisation tries to find ways to normalise it. And the programme that I run is called Pop Culture and Social Change. So using the pop cultural space to... to um, disrupt the narratives, the negative narratives. So we've done a song with a really well-known um, recording artist called Lady Leisha, and she worked with football fans to come up with a football chant. It's really quite funny. You should look it up, it's called Unity. And then also I do a lot of consultancy around equality and diversity, you know, working with organizations that want to develop their policies or their statements or, need some kind of support or help. I, so I do quite a lot of, um, around that. And my big, I guess, hat, if it, as if I haven't got enough, is um, I am um, the co-founder of a showcase platform that's located in South Africa called the Pan-African Creative Exchange, and we call it PACE for short. And it really is about um, creating a space for artists on the continent to be able to meet the global arts professionals in their space rather than always having to come off and having the challenges of visas and all those other things so that's a quick package of, of what i do so i never know what to really call that but it's, it, it's all things that i enjoy and not all things that kind of speak and link together i love i love the diversity of all of the hats that you wear and i you know in my conversations with you um Privately, it's just been really, really inspiring to see how you sort of pollinate this work, cross-pollinate it, and, and bring all of these different skills and conversations into different spaces in creative ways. So I, I just am constantly fascinated by that. Um, yeah, I would love to learn more a little bit about the equity, diversity, and inclusion work that you do, um, given that it is so relevant uh, in, in, the, in the European and in the American context at the moment with Black Lives Matter and various other social uh, movements going on. I'm curious from your experience um, what that looks like in the artistic space in Britain, for example, as opposed to in your work on the African continent. Um, hmm. yeah. I think this, I think. When I talk about equality and diversity, um, the starting point is diversity exists. We don't need to invent it, it's here. What we often talk is the equality part or the equity part is the bit that's often missing. So when I was at the Arts Council in England, I was there for about nearly nine years, we recognised that um, the organisation had been maybe 60 years old and we recognised that the group of people that were the most disadvantaged were the African the Caribbean and the Asian artists and those communities. So they set up an initiative called Decibel and Decibel had a number of programs. Some of them were funding and grant giving. Sometimes it was about um, 
initiatives that were in partnership with other parts of the organization or other outside of external organizations. Some of it was um, about policy development. So I got to work across the board. And at one of the platforms that I got particularly known for was a, a showcase platform, which is Pace is a kind of evolved version of the showcase that I was running at um, Arts Council. And I think one of the things we noticed when we were at Arts Council is every time we came to other teams to say, we, what are you doing around equality and diversity? People would almost see it as like the diversity police, like, oh God, here they come again. So we thought there's got to be a different way to talk about equality and diversity where people don't dread it. They don't feel like they're being scolded. So we started to think about what was missing from the conversation. And what was missing from the conversation was the creative case. We used to, we had a legal case, which was, you have to do it, it's the law, or it's the policy of the organization, or it's in the government of the organization. There was the um, business case, well, it's great for business, and everybody understands that M case. Then there was a moral case, which almost felt like help the poor little people. And we felt like, but with the moral case in itself, it, it, it was almost like if someone got out of bed on the wrong side, then you were screwed because you basically um, were relying on their goodwill. So there was nothing in it for the, uh, the artist. You were relying on somebody else's, something outside of yourself. So it took the power away from the, the individual. So we said the creative case for diversity basically says that it's great if you want excellence in your arts practice, you have to have diversity. And what we did is we took examples of what we call the dead white men. People like Balanchine, George Balanchine, and Igor Shavinsky, who were um, exiled um, Jews that came to New York and actually did a lot in terms of the way we look at contemporary um, practice. And they could see fundamentally, especially um, Stravinsky, when he came to New York, he saw that there was something interesting happening in Harlem, the whole jazz scene, and actually was quite fascinated. And he was fascinated because the jazz scene in, in America at the time was a real a commentary on, on, on who America was. It was fast, it was diverse, it was um, contradictory. It was a number of different things, but it actually, was almost the, it, it, it was the voice of, 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 of the new America. And um, we, we looked at these cases and said, look, if you want to get to excellence, it isn't just about diversity in terms of race. You know, you, you look at those great examples from the disability sector, um, where actually um, a disabled artist's practice or way of looking at things has actually helped people look at artwork more interestingly. Um, there was a guy called um, Clarence um, Adu here in the UK. He was a musician and he, uh, he got into an accident and he became a paraplegic. And of course, for, for somebody who's a musician like this, this, uh, this is their hard work. And he worked quite closely with some scientists and researchers who said, look, who decides on what playing is? Who decides that this is playing? Is there other things that you can be using within the body to think about what playing looks like? So they built an instrument called Headspace and actually he's become quite famous. And I don't know if those of you who engaged with the, um, the Paralympics in the UK, which was one of the most successful Paralympics, they had um, a youth um, orchestra with um, these instruments to support and disabled young people to be able to be and to play and to have a dream. And of course, that for me begs the question of whose viewpoint? Who decides that that's playing or that is playing, you know? And um, there's, there's a theory. To me, it's called the standpoint theory, and it comes out of. Um, 70s and um, feminism feminist um, theory and standpoint theory basically says the further you are from the center of the action where everything's what everything's taking place the more likely you are to have a better overview so they said while you may be in the margins 
So at the center, if you imagine a bowl and people standing around the edge of the bowl are the marginalized um, communities, and then the people in the center of the, the mainstream, if you like, what they say is because you have to constantly scan the landscape and you're also scanning with other people with different viewpoints. So somebody who's in a wheelchair has got a very different viewpoint to where they navigate the world than how I do. But if I hang out with them long enough, I'm gonna pick up things and I'm gonna be like, ah, oh, okay, this is really interesting approach. I've never thought about that before. So standpoint theory says you may be marginal, but your viewpoint is anything but marginal because you have to do the work in order to get into the center. And so um, what you find is people in the center operate between the center and they operate between the margins. And some of those people in the center work very closely with the margins. And what, they, we, what we absolutely recognize in the arts is the center does not innovate. Innovation always comes from the margins. What often happens is the center might take the, um, the work, package it. Sometimes the people in the margins don't even recognize for a while that that's actually their ideas. But this, is, this theory is a beautiful way of looking at um, why we need diversity in the arts. It's just great for the arts. Um, it's just far more interesting activity. So yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a little bit of a snapshot on, on, on um, what it looks like in, in the UK. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I, I dropped off a little bit um, in between, uh, but got the gist of it. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's really interesting to me to hear you speak about equity and diversity and the idea that diversity exists, the work that we need to do is equity. That's very profound. Um, what, this is a subjective question, but what would you say equity looks like in the performing arts field, or what do we need to make an equitable performing arts space on the African continent? This is something I've thought about a lot, actually. I think things like, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a bit of a thought stream, criticism. Criticism absolutely needs to have more diverse voices, because if you look at, if you look, even if you work with, we're just working with the canon of what people describe as theater, so there is a th there's an international data canon, especially for the global north. Um, if you've only got the same people critiquing it, how are you really going to evolve and diversify that that canon in itself? You know, then so I'm, I'm quite interested because I I read a piece on a blog and I don't recall the lady's name, but it's something that it really got me thinking, and she had gone to see a play at the public theater. And the public theater, halfway through the play, um, the black characters, um, char the black character in the play died. And they left the body on the stage for the, the, the rest of the duration of the play. And she was one of 20 odd critics that had been invited to critique this. And so she, obviously for her, leaving the body on the stage for the end to the end of the play for her was a commentary on the abuse and the violence of black men in America right she said none of the other critics actually picked up on that but what she said that was quite important that really resonated with me she said what does that do to the form what does that do to the artist the artist and the critic need that tension in order for the artist to grow and to rethink things or to not have to rethink things to re-articulate things they need that, they, they need that they strong criticism. And if you've not got that, then actually what, what is missing? And then she said also, what's missing when all of the critics at 20 odd didn't pick up? And it was bang in the middle of all these um, shootings and things that were going on in America being more um, evident. You know, we were seeing a video every week. You couldn't even keep up if, you, if this was someone that you'd seen. And I, I'm, in the UK, and I understood straight away when I was reading her, her, her criticism. So I think it's things like that where people, well, how will they see the viewpoint? How can I really understand the viewpoint of someone who's visually impaired and growing up in Brooklyn or growing up in East of London? I can't, I can be around it, but it's not the same as having them write from their own experience. So I think criticism is important. I think alongside the criticism, it's about giving people space, especially diverse um, practitioners. So you have, um, 
I, I, I sit on a board, a theatre um, board in the UK, and we um, we had a very tough task of replacing an excellent artistic director, Madni Yunus. And he announced, say, in September, I'm going, I've got a big job somewhere else. And we did the interviews in October. And what that meant is all the people that had been watching this space saw how he'd grown the space and grown the conversation around diversity in the arts. And he's really dynamic, he's cross-cutting. He brought in so many different voices. There was no artist that could say they didn't feel comfortable at the Bush Theatre in London. And it was new writing, but did really great stuff. And what I sat in interviews when people were crying and I found it actually quite traumatizing because I realized that they found a space where they could 100% do the work that had driv driven them to be in theater in the first place. Many people that were coming for interviews had sort of resorted to doing things in the canon, most probably things that didn't particularly excite them, but they did it to be accepted within the theater community. And what I realized very quickly is I said, if we'd done the interviews in February, so a good few months after he would made his announcement, people would have come, they would have had time to remember, to remember their own voice, to remember their authentic voice, and to come with a program that they would have felt was very dynamic. And it, 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 was, it was an interesting exercise. And it's, I said to myself, with the work that we're doing at Pace, this was an important space for people to be able to experiment and play without judgment. Because actually, if you're coming from a marginal community and you really want to do new writing or your work that's very different to what's accepted, sometimes you have to give up something. You, you do have to give up something. You're either giving up getting paid and being able to make a living and, and have a family and these things because you're doing your new stuff that lots of people don't get and you're taking it a bit of a risk, or you're going into the space of, 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 of making work that's within the canon and you're absolutely recognizing that there's a bit of you that you're giving up. There's a bit of you that you're losing because it's not really your hard work. It's not really why you came to theater in the first place. So yeah, I think that, so I think criticism, having a space for new writing and new voices and platforms to be able to present those, works, the people who are curious, I think are important. I think having um, people having an understanding of um, policy, how policy is developed. At that being at the Arts Council was incredibly painful at some points of my tenure there. But I, when I look back, I'm very, very glad to the experience because I have a better understanding of how things work and how decisions are made. I think things like having very good mentors you have to have uh, mentors and sponsors and people who who advocate for you when you're not in the room um i think going out to international spaces and engaging with um your peers outside of your local space this is what i guess has worked for me I, um, i'm sure i think when i first left the arts council it was much i was far more better received by the international community than i was in England. And then eventually after about four years, I, I trickled back and then I started getting lots more interest in England. But initially when I first left Arts Council England, I was doing lots and lots of my work was international. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear you as you speak about criticism as well. I hear you talking about even changing our standards, right? Like I think there's a space for changing our standards of what we understand as good work and the more work that we see that is new, that, that breaks the form, breaks the traditional barriers, um, it opens up our understanding of, of things that are possible in and out of the theatrical space. So really interesting to hear you say that as well. And also a reason why I think international work, you know, work from all over the world um, uh, is important in, in terms of looking at various theater canons. Uh, speaking about new platforms and speaking about spaces where uh, new work can be shared, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about Pace. Um, I know, I, I mean, I came in first contact with it through Erwin Mass and uh, Roberta Levito, who sort of connected us initially and had the privilege of attending um, the virtual exchange this year. But for our audiences who haven't attended or aren't sure what Pace is, uh, tell us about this, this monstrous project that you have, that you dreamt up and um, are executing at this moment. 
Oh gosh, um, well, when I was at um, Arts Council England, I ran a showcase platform called Decibel Performing Arts Showcase. And I was, I was really lucky because they gave me a lot of autonomy. They gave me a decent budget. And I was able to develop, really evolve showcasing for artists. So it actually came out of the fact that Arts Council England, they fund, a, I think at the time they had about a thousand companies that they co-funded. And they kept saying to their um, organizations, you need to diversify your programs. You need to work more with um, Black, Asian and Caribbean artists because there was a focus around that. And um, African, Asian and Caribbean artists rather. And, um, and they would say, we don't know where they are, well, there isn't any quality. So we thought, well, we know where they all are. So this idea came up. Um, it was actually birthed before I got to the Arts Council. But what I did is I came in on the second um, year of um, Decibel in 2005. And basically what it was, it was a showcase platform to spotlight um, diverse um, um, practice, to increase touring opportunities and business and partnerships, because we know that's what makes the arts world go round. But a lot of these artists would say to us, we don't know how to tour outside of our region. We don't know anybody in Manchester or in London or in Birmingham. So we said, well, we know them all, we'll put you all together. And we created this platform. When I went to, I was invited um, by Magdalena Moreno, who's now at Ithaca. She was working for Cool Tour in Australia. She invited me to come and speak about it because she really liked the platform. And while I was there, I met Ricardo Peach. About two years, three years later, Ricardo Peach moved to South Africa to run the Freistat Festival. And he said to me, you know your showcase, I know you want to do it in West Africa, but would you be interested in coming to South Africa? And it just, it made sense. Initially, I wasn't sure, but I went to Bloemfontein in South Africa where Pace is located and I could see the possibilities because I recognize one thing, artists from Africa constantly, you will know this, um, um, Krishma, um, from your own network, from your own experiences of your friends and, and people on the continent, you get invited everywhere, but the first thing you have to think about is your visa. And actually, are you even going to get the visa? It's not even about getting into the platform. It's about um, have, getting that visa, that nod. So there's some countries that are easier to get visas than others. And I thought, well, if we do it on the continent, wouldn't it make sense that most Africans can get into South Africa and most of the world can get into South Africa? They don't have a difficult visa process like the UK or the, like the US. So we set up this platform with a very similar view to what we set up the platform, how the platform was set up in England. Because to be quite frank, when I hear artists tell me what they need, there's nothing on the continent I've heard that I haven't heard in England before or in other parts of the world. It's always the same concerns. Often it's about access. It's often to do with how um, funding is set up or how the arts itself is set up that prevents certain groups of people from accessing it, um, making it, enjoying it, whatever. So with Pace, we said, right, we're going to look at the showcase platforms like Decibel, like Australian Performing Arts Market, PAMS in, in Korea, and we're going to build on what they're doing. We're gonna, we've got a bit of freedom to kind of make it the way to make it more equitable for the artists that we're trying to attract, but also for the, um, the, the arts professionals that we want to come to, to see the work. So we, it's a three day event. We have um, a, a number of strands, tour ready, which is work that's ready to go, that someone can book tomorrow. Then we have the work in progress, which still needs a bit of investment. It might be creative, um, 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 a creative producer or another artist to help sharpen it. It might be a funding, a financial investment. Then we also have um, a pitching. So we have speed pitching for people who are still are trying to figure out how to even package their idea, where they go from table to table and sharpen as they go along. And then we have sort of short pitching sections of about 15 minutes. Um, we also do a number of programs like we have a producer's lab where we work with people in our network to support 
producers on the continent. And just like in England, we have a shortage of people of color who are producing. It's very similar, the challenges are very similar in, on the continent. I mean, there's most probably more to think about on the continent, but um, the base challenges are the same. And we also do a dramaturgy lab and we're gonna be doing something actually in partnership with um, Taiwo Afalabi and HowlRound. So I think that will be coming in October, but we're looking at um, dramaturgy within the Africa context. And we work with artists to help them think beyond their local space, to help them think more about their work and how they sharpen it for a global audience, but without losing who they are within that space. So the first lab we did, we had a dramaturge that was from um, Belgium because it was funded by our, our very generous Dutch um, embassy of, uh, of South Africa. Um, so we, we always have to bring in some Dutch. So we had a Dutch Indonesian guy. We had Saki Bota, who's a very well-known festival director and playwright um, from the Afrikaans perspective. Then we had Fumi Adiwale, who led it, who was somebody who has, it was, I would describe as a, a translator between African diaspora dance, but also theatre, and she's also a dramaturge. So having everybody kind of use their viewpoint to help the artists think to do their, their, their practice. We also have another platform which is open really to anyone who wants to experiment, and it's called the Pace Fringe, and it's part of the Freistat Fringe programme, and whereby we say to people, look, you can, I think it's like a hundred US dollars to get a space, a venue, so the, the venue will give you the lighting and the staff to set you up. Mostly um, if you need props, some of the props come from the theater department of the University of Free State. And what we do is we encourage makers, theater makers, people who are trying to sharpen their voice to come and just present their work. And one of my um, colleagues that I, I work with, Hassan Mahamdani, he's in partnership with the Royal Court um, to deliver a play. And I saw it at the Royal Court and everyone that was anyone was at that scratch um, event. But what happened is when he brought it to South Africa, it was a completely different conversation. There was Senegalese there, there was Zimbabwean there, there was Kenyans there, there was people from all different parts across Africa, but there also the Australians, the Singaporeans, all the people who came. And the conversation was so much more richer having all those different viewpoints, especially what you found a lot of the, the African viewpoints were, you could see they were really considered, they really thought about his decisions, his um, intention with um, the script, with the way that, um, with how he packaged the story. And I think he found it quite overwhelming to get that really depth of richness of feedback. And it struck me in the moment that these spaces are very important for people who've been stuck with the canon. We had quite well-known um, artists like Lot Bakerman, who's a very famous Dutch playwright who wrote um, Poison. And some people that came from New York, some people that came from Nigeria, but basically presenting their work to an audience. And what we found, which was unexpected, is a lot of them picked up bookings. We didn't expect them to, we just thought, oh, but they picked up bookings from the network of people that we brought in for pace. So that, also was a, what I realized was a really important moment. And I've had a lot of interest from Europe and um, other African countries saying, look, I, I, I kind of want to test out some ideas. So really, Pace for Us was a meeting point. It was a professional um, space. It was to give people a sense that context is king. So it, you can sometimes hear about context, but when you're in the space, it's a very different experience. And we had um, a really lovely lady called Peg Shula Armstrong. She was at Lincoln Theatre. She was the former chair of IPE, And she said, I never thought of going somewhere different. I've always tried to diversify. It didn't occur to me to just go somewhere very different. And she was very, very well received. Um, Lots of people didn't know who she was, but they people just liked her and gravitated towards her. Like I saw that she was giving some of the younger women advice because they some of them had challenges in their workplace, and she just really became a really kind and very generous um, 
person to our PACE community and you found that there's a lot of people that nurture and support not just the Africans on the continent or the people on the artists on the continent, but they also support the, the PACE network that goes beyond the continent, which I thought was, which is, I think is quite nice. It's a really nice outcome of, um, of, of PACE that wasn't expected. Yeah, I mean, even from my own experience there, unfortunately, I haven't been able to attend an in-person one as yet, but uh, my virtual experience of it as well was uh, was very rewarding because I got to connect with people, you know, having, having been a student at NYU, I got a chance to connect with uh, folks at the Abu Dhabi Art Center and a lot of other really, really interesting producers, presenters, um, just to learn more about their journey and their process, and then even artists, right? And um, uh, so so I really hear you when you talk about it just being a space and network and, and, and often offshoots um, in terms of impact, the offshoots of that kind of programming are always so rewarding to see. So um, really uh, thrilling to hear you speak about that. Um, what was the difference for you, I think, or what was the largest sort of disparity in um, the in-person convening versus how you had to navigate the, the COVID pandemic? Um, I'd love for you to share with our listeners uh, what decisions you made to and how you decided to have pace during COVID. We, we'd already were on track to do, the program was ready, we were already marketing it before lockdown, we were actually quite proud, we were ahead of ourselves because last time when we opened, when I launched Pace, I literally had got a nod in the February that some funding had come through and we did it in June, it nearly killed me, it was so intense. So this time around I was like great, we're all ready and then obviously lockdown happened but straight away when lockdown happened we were online very quickly we were doing talks we were asking people where they were at what ideas what they were doing to kind of thrive and 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 sustain themselves because of course um some countries were giving emergency funds to artists some people were getting furloughed and so we decided that we'd keep conversations going and we're really lucky because Ricardo Peach, who's my business partner, the South African Australian, he actually did his PhD in something to do with experimental and digital space. So he's all over social media and the digital space all the time. So he was very quick, like said, let's just do this. And then Airmeet, a really interesting and interactive um, platform that allows you to sort of play and is set up to make you think like you're in a theatre, um, a venue space, said, look, will you test out our platform by putting your first event there? We thought, we'll just give it a go. So we did it between Ermi and Zoom. And we, we just spoke to all the artists and said, look, we have spoken to our funders and our funders have said that we can give you funding for your data, but we knew that some people would use it to eat and do some small things they needed to do. But the funders were incredibly generous about saying, you know, we recognize precarity and we like your plan. So we what we tried to create a couple of little spaces within the Entangled where we paid artists um, because we, we wanted to make sure that, the, um, that we were generating some solutions, you know. So mostly artists came on board. We decided that we would put everything that was work, that was ready to go in, in a, um, a full length video online. We wouldn't expect people to watch it, but what we would do is we packaged it by saying, we'll have an online version. And then Fumi, who ran the Geometry Lab, because she's such a good cultural mediator, we decided that we'd get her to interview all the people so that people had a bit more of an understanding of what they were looking at. And it worked out really well. So a lot of people watched the interview. So you saw the video, the full length video of the piece, and then an interview with Fumi speaking to the artist. And then during Pace, we had a discussion where people could ask more questions. And I think that worked out quite well. And then we did, during Pace, we did speed and pitching, which was quite funny because some people didn't realize that only the artists that registered for the speed pitching should move tables. Some of the artists who hadn't registered thought, oh, I want to do it now. And then kind of messed up the flow a bit, but it was quite funny. And then we had some talks um, where we spoke to people. We always made sure that we have um, um, a fair representations as, as we can access of those on the artists and cultural leaders on the continent. So we also had people, um, um, we had panel discussions as well. And then we had networking 
and moments where we were encouraging people to meet each other. And one of the things we're quite keen to do is whether you're an art artistic director, a venue director, a community artist, we just respect everyone at the same level. We just try to say that you're welcome because they are, if we want to create a fair and equitable space, you've got to recognize the contributions that a lot of community um, um, arts spaces um, contribute to shaping and evolving artists and sometimes do not get the recognition or the respect. So we try to create spaces where that everyone feels quite welcome to and that their contributions are valued. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely felt that way. I think um, Airmeet was a really interesting sort of platform to do to do that. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, so I want to open this opportunity up to all our viewers. If you are tuned in on any of our Facebook pages or on the HowlRound site, you do have the opportunity to post a question in the comments. So if any of you have any questions for Nikkei, please feel free to go ahead and post them in the comments as we enter uh, the, the last quarter of our time together. I do have a couple of uh, questions lined up myself, but um, again, you know, if, if there's any, any questions, they'll get to us and we'll be able to answer them in the last few minutes. Um, and meanwhile, I, you know, I always like to ask uh, my panelists this question because I feel I feel that there's a really uh, interesting, oh, not interesting, but growing interest. That's it, a growing interest uh, of young people uh, in the arts, and um, and so as as somebody who has had a really interesting and exciting career, and as somebody who wears multiple hats, what advice would you have for a young person um, interested in entering the field, and uh, you know? maybe even more specifically for young African interested in entering the field? I think, um, gosh, a, a young person entering the arts, I think I would say to them to try and master some aspect of it. I think there's so many people who will call themselves an expert because they've read two books and they've not really understood the mastery. And actually within Africa, we see a lot of mastery. We see a lot of artisans. You know, somebody can fix a car with a piece of string and somebody because they really understand the workings of a car. Or you'll see artists. I mean, South Africa, I was always amazed that I used to say, gosh, all South Africans can sing because they can sing is amazing. I've never heard anyone sing badly, you know. But the thing is, I think you have to have something that you master that you're very good at, that you understand inside out, that's something that is connected to your passion because that can help grow other aspects of your um, practice. And I think sometimes people forget that it's important to know your craft, you know. Um, it might be, if, we, if you're a musician, for instance, it might be that you're, you're into a particular art form, but there's nothing, a particular genre, but there's nothing to stop you from going, going to understand composition from a contemporary um, Western perspective or an Asian, um, an Indian, perspective or something that's very different to your space so that you can stop you can constantly um satisfy your curiosity you know um i think it's good to have a mentor and respect them and so it's simple things like thank you the amount of work i do for people and i don't get a thank you like they'll ask me questions and i'll respond i'll give them a response and i don't get i might take a day to pull together an email with all the information they need and I don't get a thank you. And I said, th thank people. Be gracious, I think is, is and this is, a, this is an um, advice to everyone because so many people take it for granted. If you can pay people, try to, um, and pay people don't assume because you're broke that you can't pay. Payment isn't always money. Payment can be intelligence. Payment can be other resources. Payment, payment can be, if you come to my town, uh, you can stay on my sofa or whatever but think about ways that you can make the arts space flow a bit better. Cause I think we ask too much. I do it, I, I'm not, I'm not innocent for it, but I do try to pay people back if I, if I ask them to do stuff for free, I do try to find ways to add some value. Sometimes I ask them what they need and other times I just promote them behind the scenes to other people. Yeah, I think that kind of attitude of gratitude is so, is so necessary in our community because we're so small in the sense that every, like the global theater landscape, as big as it may seem, there's always a mutual connection and the word spreads. And um, I think it's really important, uh, just as you emphasize, to, to, to keep that 
spirit of generosity alive um, uh, amongst our people. So um, it, yeah, really thank you for those, those words of advice. Um, I guess, I mean, uh, I guess we'll wrap up uh, and I'd love to uh, share with our um, audience members uh, what you're working on at the moment. I know you were speaking a little bit about it um, earlier on, but what specifically, like, is there anything we should watch out for? And also if there's a way, what's the best way for us to, uh, you know, follow you or reach out um, if, if people are interested in connecting uh, to collaborate? Oh, um, what I'm working on is I'd like, in terms of the Pan-African Creative Exchange, I would like to do more satellite activities. So we actually started the conversation, Karishma, and we will still be coming to Kenya to do something. Um, um, I would also, so I'm quite interested to do, um, to tap into spaces that we haven't got a lot of contact with. So I'm quite interested in Francophone Africa. I'm learning, I'm improving my French right now to do something there. So the satellite activity could be a hybrid event. It could be a physical event. It's something that I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of exploring for PACE to ensure that it's truly Pan-African. I'm also um, quite interested in any other networks that are out there that are interested in this South-South conversation. We've been talking to Brazil. We've been talking to um, Korea. We're talking to um, the South South Collective in Jamaica. So I'm very interested in the South South conversation. If anyone knows of anything that's particularly exciting, a network, an individual, an organization that is doing interesting things, please just flag them to us. Um, I would say to, to reach me if it's anything directly, like a, a direct question that's specific to PACE or the work that I'm doing at Counterpoints. You can just, you can either find me on LinkedIn or I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. I can't say I'm brilliant at checking all of them. I'm most probably better at che checking in the LinkedIn. So you can shoot me, but just in your, um, if you send me a note on anything, um, just say, oh, met you through how round or, or something, because sometimes I am, um, I take a long time to, take people in as friends because sometimes on Facebook I get bombarded a lot by people asking loads and loads, loads of questions or just saying hi but not saying anything behind the hi. So um, I would say those or you can contact um, Krishma or HowlRound because they have my details but um, I'm quite easy to find Nikkei Jonah. Um, I'm on Twitter, I'm on um, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram I think. And then at the Pan-African Creative Exchange um, um, website, you can also um, write the, on that website and I will get the email, the info. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I believe there'll be links. Uh, there's links in your bio as well that are on the website uh, for the Pan-African Creative Exchange so folks can sort of check the website out and uh, navigate through it. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I don't know that we have any questions from our audience members at this moment, but really, really appreciate you sharing your insights and, and having this conversation with me for the last few minutes. Um, and it's all, I like always learn something new from you. So thank you for um, sharing. Really, really appreciate it. And I, I hope you enjoy the sunshine in uh, Britain. We'll be coming to take it back very soon, I hope. <laughs> so. You have it. We will. We'll, we'll block the M visas for the sunshine. Okay. <laughs> no, but actually, oh, one, one thing I want to add, actually, in terms of um, um, advice to, to people, is for people to recognise the, the 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 public face of an institution or a network and the covert space of the network. And I describe it as a shadow structure. You've got to understand what is public, what is being said publicly and what's really going on and where the decisions are being made. And you read that by just observing and having conversations and, and picking up cues and, and, and speaking to people who, who are aware of what it looks like. So I mm. think I just wanted to add that because it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. And um, I think it's an important space, any institution you go to has got its, its public face and it's got its, um, its the covert space, especially with these systemic um, structures that need to be dismantled. That's what it looks like. 
Right, right. Well, I guess as a follow-up then, somebody looking to infiltrate that space, how would you recommend you start? I think, I think when, well, I'll give you an example. When I was at the Arts Council, I, I took on everything they said. We, you know, it was 10 million pounds investment. I brought in the fact that the law had changed and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I get to be part of this. And bit by bit, I started to see all these barriers. And then I realized there was another decision-making body that was making the decisions. And so how you get to know it, some of the secretaries, some of the past um, people that you connected with that used to work there would explain it because sometimes you get more information from the outside than when you're actually within the organization because people outside feel more comfortable to talk to you because they're not there anymore. So, and also people within the organization will, will talk. So I just think you observe, we had secretaries that would tell us stuff, the receptionists, office services. We got on with most people, you're kind, you engage with people, they start to share information, confidential information. But the important part of it is that you have to be very careful how you manage that information because you don't want to expose someone that has actually been trying to help you. So you, you've got to be quite sharp and, um, it can sometimes be very taxing because you're operating with a lot of information and you sometimes want to, to share it, but you have to find the way to share it without exposing the people that were trying to help you. So most people who are in politics and things like that recognize that, but this is something that I observed that goes on with a lot of organizations. So the shadows, what's really happening in the shadows. <clears throat> Right, right, and it's important to be strategic about that and change change things from within. Yeah. Yeah, well, an, what an empowering note to end on. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much again. I really appreciate your time and folks can reach out to us uh, when they're interested in reaching out to you and or directly follow you on your platforms. Um, and we'll see you next week or with another panelist um, as we continue our series and our journey of uh, sharing the creative practice of African women on the continent. So uh, thank you so much, Zina and Barbie, for uh, being our interpreters and to Halrant for hosting uh, this series on, on the website and uh, for producing it with us. Um, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Halrant. Thanks, Krishma. Thanks, Zina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.